example basics for DSP, which is short for digital signal processing, um, shows how to do just that, how to create digital signals um, through processing them directly. Apart from the um, from playing notes and creating time-based rhythm beat structures, um, Valen Library also um, wants to facilitate the creation of or the yeah the the, the a framework for producing sounds very much directly by by actually supplying sample data directly for um, for the for the underlying audio hardware. Um, to, to be played directly. This is actually the absolute kind of foundation basic way in which audio, digital audio is um, created on computers and computed. Um, a lot of the known effects like echo and chorus and phaser and, and bit crusher and so on and so on, they are running through some kind of digital signal processing um, uh, mechanic in a way. So um, let's look into this because it is quite easily accessible with the Valen library. Um, it is on the other hand very um, a very complex and very vast area. Also maybe just as a side note digital signal processing is really not limited to audio. Um, it's actually happening in all kinds of contexts where you have signals or data flows in a way. Um, so, uh, so when I say DSP here, it usually refers to digital signal processing in an audio context. Okay, but let's have a look. So, first we start with the boilerplate um, sketch again. So we import the library, um, and then I'm super lazy and I'm just copying over those things here. Um, And I'm just doing it like this. So saving the sketch for, I don't know, out of, out of, it's just a habit to always save a sketch when I'm writing it. So now we have the, the boilerplate um, and let's see. So digital signal processing is um, basically done by first starting the process. And here again, we, we have a, a class um, with a static method call start uh, where we huh, this where we uh, just we can supply different arguments but for now it's enough if we just um, give a reference to this sketch itself so we use this um, and then um, once we call the start method the process of digital signal processing is triggered and then runs repeatedly until the application stops or we stop the process um, so what's happening then repeatedly running means that um, there is actually a callback function which is called audio block like this audio block uh, and this function is repeatedly called um, and requests sample data or signal data um, from you from the application from the sketch um, to be then um, thereafter be played back by the um, audio hardware so um, so uh, there's actually one thing, um, so this is actually the method name, which we need to write exactly like this. And then we need to also give it some parameters. And depending on how you start the digital signal processing, um, this can have a varying number of arrays. For now, we, uh, if we just start it like this, it will just produce or will want to produce a mono output signal. So there's no input, there's no stereo output, it's really just a mono output signal. So, so this means that this callback method is called um, with an array as a parameter. And we, we just need to um, specifically exactly write like float array and then we can give it some name. I call it the samples because that is um, what it actually is. So what's actually happening here, this method is called by the DSP um, repeatedly, actually quite fast, um, because it, um, I think by default it requests 512 samples per call. So this array has a length of 512 um, samples normally by default. 
um, and um, the audio hardware, the underlying audio hardware runs at 44,100 hertz. So that means it needs like 44,100 samples per second. So um, if you do the math, um, you can tell that this is super quick and I'll just do the math in my small calculator here. So that's like 86, this one is called like 86 times um, per second approximately, something around that number. So this is actually quite fast. So, you know, like a modern days computer games run at 60 hertz. So this is actually called faster than the refresh rate of a computer game. So let's, but let's see what's happening here. So um, the audio block is called um, like 80 something, something times a second. Um, and the, what we need to do is we need to now write sample data into this array. So this array is probably empty. We can assume it's empty. Um, and if we won't, wouldn't do anything to it, let's just give it a try. We probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't yeah, see or hear anything. Um, yeah, we don't hear anything, we don't see anything. But um, if we iterate over the array, array and write data into it, um, we can now then then the underlying audio hardware sonifies the data for us okay so the um so um without getting into too many details um of like what that data has to look like um like one easy simple way uh, and but it needs one one thing that is uh, necessary for us to hear something is that the data needs to be changing over time you know if we just give it like a single value whether it's zero or whether it's one um it will just send a one to the audio hardware the audio hardware will just send translate that into a voltage or something for the speaker but the speaker will just be stuck at one but if you remember um audio is um is like you know changing um, airwaves, so the that we need to have like a changing value to hear something. Um, again, like I'm not going to into too much details, but um, but instead of just writing a single number number repeatedly into the sample buffer here, we need to write like a changing number. And the simplest way to do this is to use the random function. Um, the random function. Um, oh well, maybe the other way around. So and the audio hardware the underlying audio hardware expects values between minus one and one. So this is the maximum amplitude or the maximum range is minus one to one. So um, if we exceed that value, then it won't get, it will get ignored, hopefully, or I don't know, burn our speakers or something crazy. Um, but, um, but, but by definition, this is the maximum volume. So if we now, if we would now create um, a, um, like an audio signal between of random numbers between um, minus one and one that would be like maximum uh, value uh, volume basically um, but since random numbers between minus one and one at a maximum volume of really can be very challenging for the ears we're just using like a quarter of the of the um, you know possible volume so we are creating random numbers between minus 0.25 and plus 0.25 and um, write them to the sample buffer and then once the um, once this for loop is done we have a sample buffer full of random values and then they get played back by the audio hardware but let's have let's have a listen let's have a look at what that sounds like so this is a this is the sonification of the random values it's it sounds like a very nice clean white noise um, and that's actually all, exactly also what it is it's a, it's a um, white, no white noise generator so um, but maybe to um, to to do one extra step here um, and this is also like super helpful for kind of debugging audio um, is to to visualize also the data so there's a there's a um, there's a functionality in the DSP object uh, or class actually, which is which is um, it stores actually the last buffer it it, it played. Um, so this this audio block, this audio this buffer, um, or this audio block get buffer gets buffered in the DSP, and we can actually take that 
data and, um, and draw it onto the screen. So um, I'll just run you quickly through this. Um, so if that buffer, if it's not null, which means that it's, there's actually some data in there, the buffer actually exists. We need to do this because in the beginning it can happen that the DSP hasn't really started yet, um, but the drawing loop of our method has started to, to be called already. Um, and, then, and then we could crash our application. So this is just a precaution, just to make sure that the DSP has some buffer in its memory already or has buffered some, some audio block already. Okay, but then we can um, iterate over the um, over the buffer. So we just r r run through every single sample from that last played buffer. So if i is smaller than the this is actually a float array, of course, also similar to to this one here. So if we just um, take the length, and we will get. Um, so now we run through all the um, all the Value. So, let's let's create an an x value. Um, that is actually quite simple. So this is the 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 i that we iterate over, and that runs from zero to um, the buffer length. Which, by the way, um, I said that at some point already is uh, by default the buffer length is five hundred twelve values. Which is, yeah, it's not it's not such such a big buffer in in audio terms, but it is um, it's. Um, it's it's a reasonable, um, the big number. So we would have to visualize 512 values now in that for loop here. Okay. So uh, and that runs from zero to 512. So um, and we map that onto the full range of the screen. So something like um, zero to to width. So like we distribute these 512 values to the width of the screen, which is actually 480. But I, I like to do this in, in, you know, like in generic terms rather than actual values, because, you know, I could now change the width of the screen and I would still get like a full screen visualization. And our Y value, let me do this in contrast to the actual sketch. Let me also do this um, explicitly with, a, with a, a variable. So we map now the data that we find in the buffer every single one. So this is actually i. And as I said earlier, it is between minus one and one. And we map it now to, um, the, the, um, to the range of the screen, that which is from zero to height. And this way we actually get like a um, full screen visualization of the um, full screen, like a visualization, a drawing of the audio buffer on the full size of the canvas that we defined with size. So we need to just um, draw X and Y. Okay, let's see. We're clearing the screen, we're turning the stroke black and let's see what happens. Ah, and here you can see already um, the, the kind of the noise between minus 25, uh, 25 and, and plus 0.25, yeah. And um, this is the this is the range. So let's try maybe to do something a little bit more articulate because noise is one thing, but um, but um, maybe let's also try to do something that sounds a bit more coherent or well, sound or music like. Um, although noise can be also like very cool um, for things like creating snare drums, but also for um, you know manipulating um, more complex sounds or creating more complex sounds. Also. So um, there's one thing that is that's very, very handy is, as I said, like we need alternating um, values to create sound. So uh, the obvious thing to do, I think, is to use um, to use the, um, the the sine function because that already is pretty close to um, to a very yeah, clean, straight sound. Um, tone, like a sounding tone. Okay, so um, the sine wave function. So um, we just, you know, make this very simply. We just create a, a counter. Um, we use a counter variable. Um, what did I use? Like a, I'm using an integer, and that counter is, um, you know, is counted whenever this, whenever a new sample is requested. So we have like a continuously 
um, increasing value. So if we would um, now use the that counter on the sign function, it would um, would um, yeah um, give us some something similar to, or close to a sine wave. However, the um, the, the the sine function and processing requires radians, which is like one phase um, of a sine wave. One, yeah, one phase of a sine wave runs from zero to um, two pi, which is 6.282, something, something. Um, so if we're stepping here with integer values through this, yeah, it's, it's just in, in three, four, five, six, seven steps, it ran through one phase. Um, and that is super, super fast. So let's divide this now, um, this value now by um, some, maybe the sample rate, that's a, that's a I'm not gonna get into this now, but um, by the sample rate. Um, and so, so this like changes the, the values that we are running through from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as they are um, happening in counter to, to something like a, a fraction of, of that. So it's like point, 001.002 or something like this. So, so the sine wave is the one phase doesn't last just for seven steps, but for many, many more steps. And that is actually important now that let's have a, ah, you see. Okay, so we have a value here. It's nice that we actually visualize this because we can now visually debug it. So it's alternating up and down, but it is um, rather slow. You know, the, um, this is like a frequency of, I don't know, what's it like one, two seconds maybe, yeah? It takes to get like to the maximum, to the minimum and to the center again, that's like one or two seconds and um, one or two hertz is really far beyond the audible range. So maybe that's also create something like a, like a frequency um, that, we, um, that we just multiply to the, um, Make it maybe hundred times faster, um, and let's 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 just multiply this to the um, to this whole thing here, so it just runs a little faster again, and then we. Okay, nice. This is better already, but it's very low still. So let's let's do this. Um, And now we can start, we start to hear some kind of tone. Ah, now we hear an actual, and see also an actual sine wave, and we hear a sine wave, and it's a very, as I said, like very iconic, very clean tone. Um, maybe to do, to do like the, to give like a tiny little explanation of what I'm doing here actually is the sampling rate is 44,100 um, samples per second. So if I have my counter, and just imagine this, this would, um, what, what's happening here. So um, I'm requesting like 44,100 samples per second, and I'm dividing this by the sample rate. That would mean that I get like a, this would give me like a, a value from zero to one in 44,100 steps, basically, okay? So I'm normalizing that counter um, to bring it down from, from this huge range of integer steps to um, something much smaller. So in one second, this actually means in one second, I'm getting values between zero and one. And, um, and as I said, like sine, the sine function requires um, um, two pi for one phase. Yeah, that's the, that's the definition of the sine function. Um, so um, if I'm now getting a value range from zero to one and multiply it by, um, by two pi, I get like a value range from zero, I get like a value range from zero to one multiplied by two pi, to two pi, so zero to two pi. So that means actually in one second, I get like this one um, phase of the sine wave. Um, I can use this to my advantage because now, now that I've kind of normalized this and know that one second is exactly one phase, I can, um, if I now multiply it with a value, for example, like, um, like 200, I know that the sine wave occurs 200 times in a second. 
yeah because i'm multiplying it that one second thing one second phase i'm multiplying it by 200 i know now that it happens 200 times a second so this means actually that i have a um, every uh, like a like a oscillation of 200 hertz yeah 200 times a second 200 hertz and i don't know how much you know about music but 200 hertz is something well within the audible range um, so um, let me just play this again it's probably something similar to what we heard yeah so it's a kind of a mid low tone um, sine wave and i'm um, so so this is actually like a very simple um, kind of um, yeah, um, oscillator actually. Yeah, an oscillator, a sine wave oscillator. So now, um, if I can also make this uh, interactive a little bit. So instead of just um, giving like a fixed value to um, frequency, I can also, of course, use the, my mouse to, um, to to do this. So I'm using the x coordinate of my mouse, and that's from zero to width. That's the value range it has, and I want to map it onto a value range between 55 hertz now and 440 hertz. Okay, so whenever I move the mouse, um, it maps the position of the mouse onto this value range here of of hertz that I'll be using here. So let's see how that see how that. So if I move to the left, I get like a low sound. If I move to the right. There are some frequencies you can see where the, the, the visualization almost appears to stand still. And that's, um, that's when uh, like a relation between the window size um, and the, the, the um, block size and the, the, the block size basically and the, yeah, and the specified frequency happens. So um, yeah, this, this is one. And maybe one other tiny little thing of digital signal processing, also very interesting. Oftentimes when you hear and talk about oscillators, um, you, um, you hear that they have a frequency, which we were just developing here, but they also have an amplitude um, or a volume basically. And that kind of describes the height of the oscillating signal. Yeah? And again, the higher it is, the louder the signal is and the... Um, and the, the smaller, the closer it gets to that, to that zero line in the middle, the, the more quiet it gets. Um, so we can also do a similar thing here with, a, with the amplitude, but maybe with the other mouse axis, the Y axis. So um, up and down will now um, define like the, um, the amplitude. And, um, and we're going to do it like, so sine function always returns a value be between minus one and one, which is actually nice because it's incidentally exactly the value range of our, um, that our audio hardware yeah, expects. Um, but um, if we now multiply it with a value between zero and one, we will have that full range if we use one. And if we use, for example, 0.5, we'll have half the volume. And if we have zero, then we have no, no amplitude, no volume at all. So, so this is actually um, um, what, what this one does here. So I'm mapping the range to zero and one, and then I multiply the, the output of the sine function to that um, amplitude, to that scale, scalar value. And let's see, now I can hopefully, now I can change the, the volume from almost no volume to maximum volume okay this this shows how to create like a simple oscillator with a D DSP with a digital signal processing functionality of Valin and of course um, as I said earlier there's many 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 other things you can do within this audio block um, you know uh, implementing effects uh, creating like weird uh, yeah, sonification of mathematical functions, um, but also we can also analyze this incoming signal um, if you have uh, if you if you connect an input to this audio block, yeah, where you don't own where you do not only have to write samples to the hardware, but you can also get samples from the hardware, for example, from a microphone or from from uh, I don't know another audio source on your computer, and um, so this is like really this is like a very this is like the 
the the portal to like a whole world of of sound and music actually okay that's it for now <laughs>